Global warming is a thing. There are fewer and fewer deniers, and those who keep denying it are less and less trusted. To face the ecological crisis, industries, especially tech industries, propose a large variety of solutions. From solar panels, LED bulbs, autonomous cars, even connected farm drones, or my favorite, lab-grown meat. Basically, the idea is to create technological solutions to reduce our global consumption of energy. But does that really work? These new technologies are more complex and that is why they are supposed to be more efficient. They allow us to consume less gas, water, oil and to pollute less the air, the water, earth. But this actually doesn't work outside of Elon Musk's tweets. A freshly baked, still warm electric car has on average a twice as big carbon footprint than a traditional car. How? Let's break it down into smaller issues to answer this question. The first issue is the complexity-efficiency couple, which is supposed to solve the pollution problem, but it doesn't. You see, in order to create, maintain and recycle the new complex technologies, we need a lot more of resources and energy than we would to create, recycle and maintain older technologies. Let's take a look at Elon Musk's Space Roadster's battery. One quarter of this battery is made out of aluminium, iron and steel, elements we can easily find in nature. The other three quarters of the battery requires much less abundant materials like lithium, cobalt, manganese, nickel and graphite. To find, extract, purify, separate and assemble all these metals, a lot of energy is needed. This is called the grey energy. Musk's Roadster might be more eco-friendly while he drives it, but freshly out of production line, this high-tech car has already polluted a lot more than a random car. The grey energy cost can be applied to every single technological solution. You thought that autonomous cars would help us saving energy by optimizing their occupation rate? Maybe, but they also come with a lot of new gadgets that are very greedy in grey energy. Like cameras, radars, sonars, and you can top that with the energy needed to treat and store the 4 terabyte of data that each car will produce every day. You thought there are smart house switching on and off the lights, music and heat as you enter and leave each room would help us saving energy? Same problem here. It means using rare metals, consuming a lot of grey energy, creating a lot of data and polluting a lot. Another problem with new technologies is how difficult they are to recycle. Everything keeps getting smaller and more complex, so we need more complex technology to recycle it. So, what do we do? Nothing. In Europe, in 2012, only 5% of lithium-iron batteries used in our computers, phones and electric cars were recycled. Now, you might be thinking that at least Tesla produces less CO2 while you're actually driving it, and that is cool. Well, you're right. Compared to a traditional car, an electric car will release between 20 and 50% less CO2 during its entire life cycle. So, what's the problem? If it releases less CO2, then whatever, right? Well, not really. And here is why. Firstly, because if we keep thinking that more technology means green energy, the grey energy cost will just keep on growing. While in fact, we should think about how to produce cars that also cost us less grey energy and that we can recycle. Secondly, because having our cars releasing less CO2 doesn't make us pollute less, but more. Ok, I know this seems odd, but it is true. Basically, the more efficient our cars are and the less they cost us, the more we use them and the more cars we produce. In other words, the less we pollute, the more we pollute. This is called the rebound effect. This is a graph showing the relationship between the cost and the consumption of energy. And we can see that the less it costs to produce energy, the more we consume it. Here the price of the energy is going down, while the quantity of energy needed is skyrocketing. But that's not all, here is another side of the rebound effect. You know how when you eat very healthy for the entire week, then you feel like you have to treat yourself and you eat that 1000 calorie pastry? Well, we tend to act the same with our cars. For example, we did some amazing progress in aerodynamics, so our car needs less gas. 
but this progress is compensated by the weight of our new cars. This car, which is from the same manufacturer as this one, weights around 700 kilograms more. What happened, you ask? Airbags, electronics, more comfortable seats, basically a lot of new equipment. So despite half a century of progress, these two cars consume the same amount of gas, around 5 liters per 100 kilometers. And that's it for progress and complexity. We can hope as much as we want, but the fact is that technology just won't work as the planet's thermostat. So what can we do? If more complexity means more pollution upstream and more efficiency means more pollution downstream, we can conclude that the green technologies aren't green at all. Even if industries and their marketing labs are selling us pre-packed solutions for the ecological crisis, the fact is that we just cannot buy the ecological solution. That's just not how it works. Actually, self-driving cars, LED bulbs, farming drones and lab-grown meat tend to make things worse. Because first they are consuming more grey energy and then they make us consume more. So what do we do if we don't want global warming to boil our lobsters before we even fish them? Should we stop using our cars? Should we sabotage our own progress? Of course not. But if we really want to reduce our global footprint, we might have to stop thinking upside down. Remember this car? It's an average European car. It weighs on average 500 kilograms more than its equivalent 50 years ago and it's also twice as powerful. The only question enterprises like Tesla are trying to answer is how can we move our 1.6 ton tank more efficiently? Well, the question we should be asking ourselves is how do we not need to move that one ton of polluting technology every time we want to move our ass from point A to point B? This does not mean sending all of our needs down the drain. It means trying to respond to our most important needs in the most effective way possible. So keeping the efficiency in mind, we add another fundamental variable, sobriety. And not just behind the wheel. Efficiency and sobriety are crucial because we will at some point in the future have to choose between opulence and survival. That's just how it is. And when I say in the future, I mean pretty soon, if not immediately. However, how do we mix efficiency and sobriety? How can we move on short, medium or long distances with a smaller, lighter, less complex, less powerful and more eco-friendly vehicle? Well, there is an actual solution, but not everyone will like it. A bicycle. If you drop the battery, the windows, the AC, the leather seats and two wheels, you can divide the mass of your vehicle by 130 and its CO2 cost of production by 27. And while the bicycle might be a bit of a problem when it comes to longer distances, surprisingly inside the city its speed is the same as the cars, 15 km per hour. This amazing sober technology also has a very low cost of grey energy. It limits the rebound effect, since it's less comfortable than a Tesla Model 3 and we are therefore less likely to take it for a spin just because we have nothing better to do. Yes, I hear you. This might be a bit extreme, a bicycle is not always the best idea. For example, it's a very bad choice if you have to transport a couch. But what is important to understand here is that technology should always be friends with sobriety. If we really want to reduce our global footprint, we have to consider how to reduce our needs and then find an efficient yet sober way how to satisfy those needs we cannot replace. And guess what? Through time and space, we have already developed sober and efficient technologies. They might seem less glamorous than the Musk Space Roadster, but they have this little je ne sais quoi that won't make the blue planet become red. Remember this car? As mentioned before, this 50-year-old car needs as much energy as our modern cars, just because it's lighter. And that's total nonsense, right? A new modern car should be consuming less energy than an older one. That's what progress is. So if we want to reduce our global footprint, we should maybe drop some unnecessary features like power windows, power door locks or heated seats, although that's nice, and reduce our carbon footprint. Another solution is an e-bike. It's a mix between a motorcycle and a bicycle. You can pedal it or let it drive for you. It works with electricity but doesn't consume a lot of it. It is not as complex and as polluting as a Tesla and it's still very helpful if you live in a hilly neighborhood. 
If ecological solutions are not trendy in the Western countries, we can still find quite a lot of them in other parts of the world. Like this tricycle, still popular in India, which is a real alternative to a car for short and medium distances. Tricycle was very popular in Europe in the 60s, but it's not so trendy nowadays. And for long distances, India rocks again. The Renault Quid is very popular there. It weights only 660 kilograms, more than one ton less than a Tesla Model 3. Finally, my favorite one is the e-trike. The e-trike is a very clever mix between a car and an e-bike. There are many different models, this one is called Podride. It weights only 70 kilograms, can drive you around for about 100 kilometers before you have to charge it and can reach 30 kilometers per hour, while needing approximately 50% less energy from your legs than a regular bike, even when the battery is off. E-trikes are perfect for short and medium distances, and also protect you from bad weather, as they can be covered and heated. You might see me riding this baby around Europe in a couple of years. Say hi! Of course, it's important to add that Tesla is not the only technological solution that is not helping the planet in the long run. Lab-grown meat is a thing because many of us just can't imagine living without this delicious, protein-packed luxury. But just like it used to be a luxury in the past, it's becoming a luxury today as well. And while lab-grown meat might have a smaller carbon footprint than raising animals for food, lentils and soy are also great sources of protein, and the amount of CO2 they generate is one of the smallest you can get. Smart houses are a great idea and a complete fail at the same time. Turning the lights on and off, well, we can do that ourselves without being completely exhausted at the end of the day. Regulating our own heat, well, we can do that manually. Cooling our places to 18 degrees during the summer and warming it up to 25 during the winter? Well, we don't really need a smart house to tell us how ridiculous that is. And that's it for today. Thank you for watching. Now tell us in the comments what do you think about this video? Are you also disappointed? I was really disappointed when I learned about all these problems with Tesla because I really wanted one. Like the video and share it so more people can learn about this and rethink their consumption of grey energy a little bit. And don't forget to subscribe to not miss our next video. And see you then. Bye bye!